December marks five years since this poorly animated testicle locked our childhood in a cold basement and went all Joseph Fritzl on it, the result being so extremely unpleasant to witness that it would be removed if you uploaded it to Pornhub, not because of copyright, but because it violates even the sex trade's warped notions of decency. The Last Jedi was one of those rare achievements in snuff artistry. It took time for the full horror of it to sink in. In fact, it's questionable whether the full horror of it has yet sunk in. Each time you watch it, you spot something else that is at best incompetent, at worst plot-breaking and world-destructive. Every competent video essayist you watch reveals to you a smorgasbord of shite you passed over when you last saw it, another plate of slop, Peter or the RSPCA, would stage protests about were you even to think of feeding it to your least favourite dog. It's impossible to overstate the damage this film did to Star Wars, to its lore, to its fans. I know and speak to people. You'll find some of them on Mr. Brown Alliance live streams, link in the description, who were giving serious thoughts and never watching anything to do with Star Wars ever again, knowing that J.J., Ryan Johnson, and Kathleen Kennedy, the Jillian Maxwell of Star Wars, have already paved the road to hell with the wreckage of violated childhoods. Nothing was left untouched. Major characters were assassinated. Ancillary but established characters flushed whimsically out into space. New characters wrecked other new characters. Others casually tore up the established mechanics of the universe. The most terrifying thing about its villains was how they were abandoned by its writers. The most terrifying thing about its writers was how they thought any of this was a good idea. This is far from a comprehensive list of its faults. It would be quicker to write a book about its merits. The wit and wisdom of Star Wars The Last Jedi, all its pages would be blank. Though I was, and am, planning a review to mark its five-year anniversary, I was otherwise content to leave it rotting in its open grave with the corpses of all those characters we once loved, and a great many we never had a chance to. It's depressing, and Disney's busy ruining other timelines, even other franchises. The fight continues in the present, the past can wait, or so I thought. Except no, it can't. Because this last week has, inexplicably, seen The Last Jedi trending on Twitter, People in the year 2022 are still trying to defend this abomination, the Order 66 of the franchise. And their arguments are just as bad as ever they were. These people have had five years to learn, to hone their skills and their points to improve, and yet they've remained at best static, undeveloped as though Ryan Johnson had written their character arcs. I thought about doing a quick video going through some of the finer examples on Twitter, but this would necessarily be difficult to structure, and given how many people regret having to combat the wombat logic of the Twittersphere, there seemed little point in bringing that largely futile endeavour to this medium. So I've taken a different approach, because, roughly coinciding with the continuity TLJ lot detonating their car bombs on Twitter, some galaxy brain at MovieWeb has, like Slobodan Milosevic dancing on the master bodies he slaughtered, climbed atop the desecrated mound and celebrated the crime with a review, declaring it, The Last Jedi that is, the best movie in the Star Wars sequel trilogy. Yes, there really are people who want to go through all this shit again. And since it is the review equivalent of a pineapple being shoved up your urethra, I thought I'd attempt to counter it with a stream of highly pressurised ear piss. Let's do it. So we're going to go through this review instead. Needless to say, this is not an invitation to do or say nasty things to the author of this piece. Everyone starts somewhere, and even if shilling for Ryan Johnson, The Last Jedi, and Disney Star Wars generally is the equivalent of volunteering to mop up the Death Star trash compactor while it's running, I suppose someone needs to do it. It can't just be left to the out-of-work hentai monster that lives in said trash compactor, or professional YouTube shills. The author has the right to be completely wrong and to have disastrously bad taste. But we have the right to say it is completely wrong, and in disastrously bad taste. And it needn't reflect very badly on her character or ours. Many of the points raised are objectively incorrect and poorly expressed. So, with no ill will toward the author, who I'm sure wasn't immune to the allure of clicky-click-clicks anyway, but with a good deal of genuine ill will toward the burning feces she's marketing as perfume, here we go. You'll have to forgive the sometimes curious grammatical and stylistic choices made by the author. Young journalists, I am one just about, will often try to sound clever and just as often fail, but with that in mind we begin. She writes, 
Following its long-awaited cinematic reprise in the wake of its Disney acquisition, Star Wars made its return to theaters in 2015 with Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens. The space epic reintroduced itself through a three-part arc that would keep in stride with a trio of central heroes who were determined to take on the First Order. Or, as in fact happened, The Force Awakens would introduce a trio of central heroes, two of whom would be relegated to the status of irrelevant nuisances by Ryan Johnson, and one of whom would be actively deprived of a consequential and meaningful character arc by an insufferable diversity hire with some of the worst lines in all Star Wars. Quite a feat when you consider George Lucas exclusively wrote the dialogue for four of the nine films. She continues, A new wave of Star Wars was determined to find its success by identifying the exact intersection between nostalgia and innovation. Well, ignoring that waves are not typically determined to find success by identifying the exact intersection between anything, never mind between nostalgia and innovation, this is a point that holds true for The Force Awakens, not for The Last Jedi. Granted, TFA was a J.J. Abrams film, so nostalgia translates as the same, and innovation as but bigger. But TFA at least understood something of the potency of nostalgia, and sought to reintroduce fans to a long-dormant franchise by feeding them healthy doses of the familiar. TFA's basic plot structure was a carbon copy of A New Hope. Orphan on a desert planet leaves on the Falcon with wise mentor, becomes embroiled in a galactic struggle against an evil empire armed with a planet-destroying superweapon. Mentor gets killed, Orphan finds the Force as the planet-destroying superweapon is destroyed following a starfighter battle, and a variant of the trench run, the end. This level of sameness was disappointing, but the approach was at least understandable. The aim was to mimic as closely as possible the fundamentals of the film that began the franchise. It played on nostalgia positively, if often mistakenly. Han Solo's death was lamentable, and his characterization unfortunate. But his murder was designed to mirror that of Obi-Wan in A New Hope, and then to reveal something positive about his character, namely his unconditional love for his son, and that goes some way toward explaining and excusing his earlier failings. In Finn and in Kylo Ray, it sought to innovate, and it didn't always fail. There's no analogy in the original trilogy for a fallen stormtrooper gone good, while Kylo Ren, perhaps most of all, represents the balance between innovation and nostalgia struck broadly right. Kylo Ren could not exist without Darth Vader, but his relationship with Vader, his sense of inferiority, his comparative vulnerability, the flaws beneath the mask, if you will, made him unique. That JJ couldn't maintain this vulnerability while making Kylo a competent fighter, instead having him lose every consequential encounter to our novice yet overpowered hero, and so reducing his threat level by orders of magnitude is a significant failing in the film, but not one with which we are here concerned. TFA was, in short, the attempt to ease fans into a new story by spooning hefty doses of sweet member berries down their throats. The author of this review will go on to argue that TLJ is hated because it is different, We'll come to the specifics later, but since we're concerned here with the claim that the film likewise attempted to find the balance between innovation and nostalgia, that's the one we'll address first. And the answer is, of course, that even if it tried, The Last Jedi failed. It was motivated by a profoundly different ideology and philosophy. Like TFA, it did borrow liberally, comically even, from the plot structure of the OT, in this case Empire Strikes Back, with smatterings of Return of the Jedi beginning with a flight from a rebel base, an imperial fleet headed by a superstar destroyer, an unresolved duel of the fates, then inverting that structure to close with a battle featuring 8080s on a planet that was for all intents and purposes Hoth, but of course, instead of snow, there was... Salt. Honestly, the fucking writing in this film. But to the extent it played on nostalgia, it was not to elevate, but rather to subvert what went before it. This makes it very different from TFA. The entire point and purpose of TLJ can be summed up in Luke Skywalker throwing his lightsaber off a cliff, not something you'd ever have seen in TFA, and something JJ tried to mend, albeit with a comic lack of subtlety, in The Rise of Skywalker. A Jedi's weapon deserves more respect. It was designed to subvert expectations. But the mistake its defenders make, and this reviewer will do the same as we'll see, is to conflate subversion with nihilism. It presented us with what we know and love, and it killed it. It was like showing a child a bag full of kittens, then making that child watch as said bag was weighted and thrown into a river. Its point was categorically not to find the right balance between innovation and nostalgia, because it established the two as enemies of each other. To the extent it was innovative, it destroyed nostalgia. To the extent it was nostalgic, it was not innovative. There was in fact a balance to be struck, 
We've subsequently seen in The Mandalorian and in the latter episodes of The Book of Boba Fett a belated attempt to assert precisely this balance against the nihilism and destruction of TLJ. But this film's attitude toward balance was the same as the attitude toward the Jedi and the balance in the Force that it inserted into the mouth of a man it called Luke Skywalker, after having murdered the real Luke Skywalker and replaced him with Jake Skywalker, Luke's deadbeat alcoholic older brother. There is more than enough in this philosophy to wreck a whole franchise, yet astoundingly this summary only touches on the film's utter inability to innovate in its own right. Its most innovative scenes were unarguably its worst, its most innovative decisions that did not involve figurative character assassination were just as damaging in their own way, raising consequential parents, the death of Snoke, Rose robbing Finn of a meaningful arc in an apparent attempt to aid the First Order, and the whole sorry Canto bite sequence, but we'll come to some of that later. The reviewer continues, The Disney conglomerate was the crux in the Star Wars renaissance that held such an omnipotent draw to lifelong fans and curious saga newcomers alike. Yeah, no, Disney was the Ark in The Last Crusade. She writes, The evident yet unfortunate disdain for the sequel trilogy was arguably not a product of favouritism of past Star Wars trilogies. Additionally, the easy, almost unfair scapegoat of comparing one trilogy to another was not to blame. Instead, the internet encouraged the open rejection of the sequels after the concluding piece of the trilogy resulted in overwhelming backlash. I see. It was the internet that pesky fucking internet, that's what did it. It wasn't this fetid abortion of a film, it was the internet which encouraged the open rejection of the sequels. What does this author think the internet is? Of whom does she think it's composed? Does she think it's some kind of mystical cosmic entity, a force unto itself, standing apart from humans, and so, by extension, apart from the fans? Were the fans completely united only for the internet to corrupt them and turn them to the dark side? Maybe it was all the work of Russian bots, is that what she's saying? This um, implausible theory at least has more backstory to substantiate it than TLJ gave Snoke and the Knights of Ren, just by the by. I think the film most people would readily associate with fan backlash was uh, TLJ, not The Rise of Skywalker. The Rise of Skywalker was an absolute catastrophe of a film, needless to say, but it's not the one that split the fan base or that broke the law, not significantly or not as significantly anyway. It's not the one that created the backlash. The box office returns alone provide some hint as to the enormity of the disillusionment achieved by TLJ. The Rise of Skywalker could not be responsible for the fact so few people bothered to go and watch it, because effects cannot logically precede their causes. The damage had already been done, hence the dramatic decline in box office receipts. I know quite a lot of people who would only watch The Rise of Skywalker as a kind of bleak comedy, but who nonetheless acknowledge the monumental wreck JJ was left with by Ryan Johnson and TLJ, a mess Tatooine's entire population of Jawas would have been unable to salvage. We have some idea what J.J. thought of what he'd been given, because he made it very clear in several of his own decisions, just about stopping short of mentioning Ryan Johnson specifically when he has Luke deliver the line, a Jedi's weapon deserves more respect, and otherwise making overt moves to retcon some of the worst decisions made by his predecessor. Again, nobody is defending, nobody should defend, the rise of Skywalker on its own terms. J.J. took a bad thing and somehow managed to make it worse, but when addressing the damage done, there is simply no comparison. It's disingenuous to pretend the backlash arose in response to the rise of Skywalker. Anyone who spent any time online at the time or since could tell you it was The Last Jedi that shattered the fanbase, and for good reason. The author continues, The sequels were consequently subjected to internet vitriol. Above all, Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi has succeeded in becoming one of the most divisive entries into the Star Wars canon. Now this is um, a TLJ level plot hole. Having been told that the rise of Skywalker caused the backlash, we're now told that The Last Jedi has succeeded in becoming one of the most divisive entries into the Star Wars canon. Effect precedes cause, apparently, and to say it is one of the most divisive entries into the canon is a significant understatement. It is by far the most divisive entry into the canon, which, after all, was the purpose of this person's review, was it not? She continues, its individuality and deviation from expectations should credit The Last Jedi as being the sequel's best work compared to its current reputation, but the very nature of being different was the fundamental reason for its negative reception. 
No. 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 Just no. Absolutely not. The author leaves one with the unfortunate impression she has not ever read any of the arguments against her position, never mind considered basic points of writing, plot, character construction, and the fundamentals of good movie making. A point of criticism of The Force Awakens was that it was not different enough, as we've said. This criticism was widespread at the time, it's only grown since. The fact of difference is utterly irrelevant. The manner of difference is what earned TLJ its negative reception. There were many things you could have done that would not have earned the fans' ire. By extension, were one rewriting TLJ now, and I know someone who is, there would be much one could do differently that would improve it. Almost anything, in fact. It's plot holes and abysmal writing, it's ludicrous tangents, it's irrelevant side quests, it's absent world building and motivations, it's cat handed disposal of one of its key villains, and most pressingly, it's utter destruction of one of the most adored characters in cinematic history. That's why it's hated, but we'll come on to these presently. She continues The movie, of course, is not without its flaws. Fuck me! But The Last Jedi deserves recognition for daring to go where no other movie in the franchise had gone. The bin, presumably. Um, this, though, this is a problem with the argument. It foists its own lack of nuance on fans. It wrongly accuses fans of hating anything different, and in so doing, it fails to appreciate that there are many potentialities in differentness. There is no one way to be different. There are many different ways of doing different. And some things that are different are better than other things that are different. If tomorrow I woke up as a Jedi able to wield the Force, that would be different and, speaking for myself, that would be better. If I woke up with a toilet system plugged into my throat, that would be different as well, but that would be worse. Having failed to make this distinction one way, the author fails to make it another way. Fans are wrong because they think anything different is bad, she says. She is correct because anything different must be good. In which case I invite her to taste chipmunk poo, because that would be different, darling. And so apparently, by your logic, also, that would be good. <laughs> Disgruntled discussions contest if Skywalker is truly still Skywalker in The Last Jedi. Denial over Johnson's character treatment still sparks debate far after the film's release. There's the difficulty to accept the final on-screen version of the character because of how sharply his behaviour has changed. They must show other sides of who they are. Skywalker's resentment, anger, self-grief and exhaustion are brought to the surface during The Last Jedi, causing a rejection of his outward angst. I'm sorry to have to say this is borderline illiterate, but it is. Discussions can't be disgruntled, and they cannot contest. People in discussion can be disgruntled, and can contest points made in the discussion. Anyway, no one is denying the slowly deflating Space Hopper's character treatment now that it's happened. That's why we hate the fucking film. Mark Hamill reportedly tried to at the time, and don't we all wish he'd succeeded? It's precisely that treatment that is the subject of debate. And to be clear, it's not that his character changed, it's how his character changed. Luke was in fact always flawed, he always contained the potential for flaws. His dancing along the line dividing the dark side from the light, between his father's fate and his own, between the Emperor's plan and the Emperor's defeat, is the whole point of his story. This is his character, these are the stakes, this is why he is integral to the narrative. His ultimate victory, which comes at great personal cost, and which was so close to being his ultimate defeat, is the culmination of his story and, properly, of the Skywalker's saga. It was compelling because the stakes were that great, because, unlike Rey, we were able to see him grow, to see him fail, to see him overcome these vast odds. The reviewer's argument actually works perfectly when you replace Luke with Rey, the irony being that the faults she attributes to the depiction of Luke in fact apply to the main character of the film she's defending. Luke's arc was profoundly optimistic, but far from simplistically so. We'd not have been so invested had he been from the off an overpowered space Jesus able to effortlessly overcome all the odds stacked against him. The potential for darkness in him is what makes him compelling, and his ultimate victory that much more meaningful. The reviewer says that we see Skywalker's resentment, anger, self-grief, and exhaustion in The Last Jedi, and that's why we don't like his depiction, but we saw all of that in the original trilogy. The reason we resent and reject his depiction in The Last Jedi isn't some new complexity, it's the opposite. 
There is nothing subtle and complex about the quivering wreck he became. And to pile on the insults, this quivering wreck has had all his moral fortitude and purpose and past achievements stripped away. He didn't overcome the odds, face the temptation of the dark side, find his place on the light and defeat the Emperor, thereby restoring or helping to restore balance to the Force. No. The sequel trilogy in general, and TLJ in particular, relegate all his story, all his arc, all his achievements to an irrelevance. He solved nothing. He fixed nothing. He ended nothing. He's become a sorry footnote in his own damn story. And on top of all that, no justification is ever given for this change in character. It's barely explained at all why he went from triumph to ultimate defeat, and whenever the film tried to explain it, its attempts were laughable. Having brought Darth Vader back from the dark side, despite all he'd said and done, in TLJ we see Luke attempt to murder Kylo Ren, his fucking nephew, because he saw the mere potential of the dark side in him and got scared. It's at least theoretically possible to write your way to this position, to achieve this decline in a way that, while still abhorrent, nonetheless makes some sense, but absolutely none of this is even attempted by TLJ, which obliterated his character off-screen and presented us with the empty shell of Jake Skywalker and just expected us to fucking accept it. It adds profound carelessness to the already bitter insult that was its depiction of Luke Skywalker. Ryan Johnson's sole interest here was in subversion, and he didn't even have the decency to construct it carefully, he took a fucking shortcut. Also, the reviewer's line about his exhaustion causing a rejection of his outward angst makes literally no sense. Did she write this essay in Korean and stick it in Google Translate? She continues, Throughout the Star Wars canon, Skywalker has been asked to remain undefeated. Uh, okay. <laughs> His attitude and resilience appeal to his unwavering determination have oh what? His added sorry, it's the syntax. His attitude and resilience appeal to his unwavering determination have only allowed his character to develop to a certain extent. The moral ambiguity that is introduced contradicts Skywalker's belief that there is genuine goodness found in everyone despite their past. In The Last Jedi, there is a retraction of such an outdated personal naivety. Just... no? We've already explained why this point is utterly baseless. It's as though the reviewer has never watched the OT. And to say that Luke is morally ambiguous in TLJ is just risible. He's not morally ambiguous, he's a moral wreck. He's a shell. There's no ambiguity there. He has no good in him, he doesn't even have evil in him, he has nothing. To compare this favourably with the complexities inherent to his character in the OT is laughable. To strip Luke of this fundamental belief, the one that led him to redeem his father, is to remove the very essence of Luke Skywalker. This isn't outdated personal naivety, this is moral fortitude, it's love, it's loyalty and sacrifice. It's the overcoming of naivety. Empire Strikes Back showed us viscerally the consequence of his naivety, it almost gets him killed. It reduces him to his lowest point. It's by overcoming this naivety, but sticking true to his fundamental principles, his fundamental belief in the goodness of Anakin where everyone else, including Anakin's old master, saw only evil manifested in a loveless and cruel machine, it's because of all that that Luke is able to overcome the greatest evil in the galaxy. Outdated personal naivety, fuck off. It was later that Skywalker came to his final conclusion that hope can be restored and that evil cannot truly be defeated. He grapples with the repercussions of the dark side and its unshakable impact left on Kylo Ren and understands that he cannot save him from himself. Again, he did this for his father who was the dark side. Kylo Ren had the potential for the dark side and Luke got scared and tried to kill him in his sleep. Sorry, not Luke, Jake. Luke would never do this, it makes absolutely zero sense. This isn't character progression, this is character assassination, thoughtlessly accomplished, for no purpose other than subverting our expectations. Johnson took the liberty of challenging the binaries of good and evil. Through an alternative perspective of one of the series' flagship characters, he proves that in order to experience growth, there must be discomfort. Yeah, because we never saw that before. His arc in the OT was just a breeze. He was always the undefeated space Jesus. Absolutely, it's about time he was put through his paces. 
Skywalker's drastic shift in personality was an unpredictable, uncomfortable component of the film. It provided a necessary outlook on character that needed to have their entire personality explored. What personality? He doesn't have a personality in TLJ. You absolutely could have explored more of his personality. It wasn't fully formed even at the end of Return of the Jedi. Again, the Book of Boba Fett actually does this kind of well, at least compared to TLJ, which doesn't try in the first place. In one short scene with Ahsoka, we see his doubts, his uncertainty. We see that his story didn't end with the death of the Emperor. We see that his concerns about taking up the mantle, the responsibilities now left to him, the enormity of the task of training the first student of the new Jedi Order, the challenge of rebuilding that order. The Book of Boba Fett explores more of his personality in a scene than TLJ does in its entire duration. It was a development on what went before it. TLJ makes no sense in that context. It doesn't lead from any established position, it fills in no gaps, it doesn't explore anything, it just kills him. Skywalker was allowed to grieve the loss of himself while reflecting on whom he once was. His bitterness can be justified when considering the scope of his character arc. Fuck off. Having Skywalker cast a final forlorn look at the twin sons of Tatooine while dying, drenched in the warmth of them both, is an incredibly heartfelt conclusion to the character's legacy. Okay, I know you haven't watched the OT, that's pretty clear from your argument, but have you actually watched TLJ? He doesn't die on Tatooine. He disappears in a puff of depression on Akto, no? From what I recall, and I've not found it in myself to watch that abomination in a good while, there is a shot of the sun designed to evoke Tatooine, but he's not on Tatooine. And it's not a heartfelt conclusion to his legacy, not at all. His legacy has been destroyed. The existence of the sequel trilogy destroys his legacy, because it proves it was all utterly pointless. The character of Luke Skywalker cannot be used in defense of this film, because it's one of the most damning aspects of this film. <laughs>